Welcome, everybody. I am so excited about this season of webinars. Yes, the pandemic has really been difficult, but I actually believe in the strangest of ways that it's created a world of expanded possibilities. And I am hopeful that all year long, we can show you that we can use some of the lessons learned from the pandemic to create stronger families and more successful workplaces. And there's no better way to do it than have Scott Beeson join us today. I am so lucky to have him be part of this call and so lucky that he created the whole person workbook just when he did. Um, he's also a great author of the Working Dad Survival Guide um, and someone who's really been uh, personally following an integrated path in his own life and professionally helping others to think about these things, both as a professor and consultant and speaker. Um, and so when Scott joins us, you'll see that we're gonna be talking about this amazing book, how we can create a whole person workplace. And I'm gonna give you a couple of slides that are my quick summary about what we can learn if you read Scott's book, which I highly recommend, by the way. What I loved about Scott's book is as Third Path understood 20 years ago, yes, flexibility is about helping parents balance work and family responsibilities, moms and dads, parents of all genders, but it's also an everybody issue. And in order for really to make change, you need to have change happen at the individual, team, and organizational level. And I'm gonna give you an example of that. We're gonna be talking a lot about it's about flexibility, but it's also about capacity management. And so one simple example is if we think about vacations. And you know, part of being able to turn off work on a vacation is an individual preference and an individual skill set. But part of taking a vacation is also the team working together to support each other to turn off work on vacation. And as Scott talks about in his book, there are even some organizations that are now creating kind of a coordinated approach to vacation and having everybody turn off work at the same time. So you don't come back to a ton of unexpected emails or other tasks added to your list, but instead you truly en enjoy your vacation. So we really see this as an everybody issue and everybody needs to get smart around flexibility and how much work they can handle capacity management. Let's talk a little bit more about this. So at the individual level, what we learned this past year is that not all jobs could be done virtually or remotely. Um, and not everybody wants to do it remotely. And depending on the life stage you're in, you also might have a changing preference about whether you wanna be working more or less on site. And so this is gonna be true going forward. And this has certainly been true for the last 20 years as we've helped people think about following their third path an integrated approach to work and life. But it's also about the team. And in particular, it's about your supervisor and your manager and their skills in thinking in an integrated way. We're gonna talk a lot about this in our next webinar in November. We have an amazing example of a manager who's been thinking smart and some great research on this topic. So please come back in November to learn more about that. And it's also what's happening at the organizational level. Scott has lots of information in his book, which we won't be covering a lot of today, about how there's all kinds of ways organizations need to be thinking about this from parental leave to elder care. I love his section on financial assistance. And the whole point that this is a lifelong learning process for everybody involved. And as you see in there, we're also talking about parental leave in February. Like I told you, all year long, we're gonna be looking at how we can really change work to be more supportive for us to live whole lives. And as you know, Third Path has been doing this for a long time. And what we've really seen is that when you support a professional to follow this integrated approach, when you support them to live that whole life, when you become that whole life workplace, you really create a very different kind of leader. And we have a big special announcement about our Third Path Leader Guide that we'll be telling you more about on Giving Tuesday. Um, so stay tuned. We've got a great resource for you that you can find on our uh, free resources page on our website um, about leaders who follow this path. All right, 
So it's about flexibility. It's about capacity management. We're going to get to that in more detail. Before we go there, I want to um, have Scott tell me a little bit more about, you know, what is um, some of the surprises maybe as you were doing this research and writing of this book, uh, you know, because again, something you've been car caring about for so long, I bet you learned a lot while you're working on it. Yeah, I really did. And first off, thank you for having me and thank you everybody for being here. Um, yeah, so actually I started um, this book project um, pre-pandemic and uh, it was gonna focus much more on working parents and it was gonna have some advice like, hey, let people work from home every now and then, right? And of course, that got obsolete very, very quickly. And also the bulk of the interviews I did, and I talked to representatives of about four dozen companies, plus a lot of uh, thought leaders like Jessica and like Delta, who you'll hear from a little later, um, about like right in the spring and summer 2020, when all these organizations are really trying to figure out, how do I take care of the business? How do I take care of the human beings who work for me? And, you know, and that's why the approach of the book got a lot bigger, a lot broader as uh, looking at people, uh, as employees and valuing them as whole people, not as a part of the machine, not as like, uh, you know, a part of a person who shows up for eight hours a day, not even as an asset that's, that we should treat well just because it returns on the investment for us, but as a whole person, because through the pandemic, you know, many people knew this already, uh, but it became clear to many employers that the separation between work and life was always somewhat fictional. Um, we, in many workplaces, we got a view into each other's houses and cats and children and all the other stuff that was going on. And everybody's dealing with, uh, is still dealing with a really difficult situation with a lot of anxiety, um, a lot of focus on employee wellness, both physically and you know mentally and psychologically. And I think a lot of employers, at least the ones I talked to, really took that seriously that, um, that it, it's both the right thing to do and good business to value our employees as whole people with lives, responsibilities, and challenges, and stressors, and, and passions outside of work. Um, and in most cases, a desire to bring a good amount of themselves to the workplace, too. If somebody's not doing well outside of work, right, because they're, you know, it could be a, a young employee dealing, like, student loan debt is crushing them. Uh, it could be a, a you know, working parent with young children who, you know, of course, are dealing with a whole amount of juggling. It could be people later in their life dealing with elder care or financial issues or just time for life or uh, burnout issues or, or whatever it could be. Um, you know, if people are struggling with that, they can't really show up fully uh, in the workplace. So many employers and the ones I profile, I try to profile like positive examples to show that this can be done. And examples from multinational giant companies to literally a, um, a general store in the White Mountains of New Hampshire with 12 part-time employees. So it can be done on any budget with any type of workforce. But basically, if you value employees as whole people and you take on a little bit more responsibility to say, what can I do to enhance the rest of their lives, to relieve some of that stress, to make it easier for them to rise to their challenges, to put some value on their priorities and passions. If we do that, you know, we're, we're um, unleashing a whole lot of energy, positive energy and a culture of care that, that continues on. And again, uh, how this plays out, you know, really depends. The large multinational can do the extensive parental leave policy and all these other things. The small company might not be able to do that, but they can do other things. Um, and hopefully maybe we'll talk today about, you know, uh, in different situations, how you might uh, think about getting started um, with enacting policies, programs, decisions, or just tweaking the stuff you already do in terms of performance management or your compensation benefits, or even your hiring and onboarding um, to make sure that you, A, are sincerely valuing employees as whole people, and B, you're showing it um, in, in all these yeah. positions. You just listed something right there about hiring and onboarding, and we hope to get to talking a little bit about culture at the end if we have enough time, mm -hmm. because that's something, you know, again, some of us are further along on this uh, uh, process than others, and it turns out, you know, finding the right people and bringing them in the right way um, and bringing them into a culture that values whole people and helping them develop skills so they too can 
be that person who has a better uh, ability to, to meet their life responsibilities alongside their work responsibilities. That's, that's a really great one. And at su- I want to talk about supervisors around this too, because, you know, yes, we're going to talk about this next week, but I would imagine, you know, something you and I talked about, you know, one reason why third path leaders, I think did an exceptional job this past 18 months is because they've done flex. They have done capacity management for themselves. They understand there is such a thing as too much work. And when people are dealing with work, family, and the pandemic, they understood that maybe it wasn't just flexing. Maybe it was actually helping people work less, set lower, more reasonable goals, maybe even give them a time to take a sabbatical. Um, So how much do you think supervisors play a role in making this whole person workplace um, effective, remembering that we're going to spend a big time talking about this in November? Well, no, supervisors are kind of the tip of the spear when it comes to culture change and things like that, right? Leadership, you know, needs to, to put out the, um, the vision and the, you know, the value statements and to en- enact that in a broader sense. The HR department are the experts in building policies and programs around these values, but really how they're translated and how they interact with individual employees you know, so much of it depends on the, the immediate supervisors and managers. So, you know, if they're, uh, you know, on board, um, they can translate the policy and program into something that, that, that someone can use. If they're not on board, they can really derail a whole sincerely held effort. Um, so I think it's really, really important. And, you know, supervisors need to role model this and how they treat people. Maybe they need to role model it how they work in terms of not emailing the team at 11 o'clock at night. Um, not expecting, you know, people to, um, you know, having reasonable expectations for where, when, how uh, work gets done, um, you know, role modeling, how you treat people, um, how you show care for people and individual consideration for people. And that does not mean lowering standards at all um, or getting rid of accountability at all. What it means is, you know, we manage for, you know, what's best for the human being who is working for me. And, you know, if it's working better for them as a whole person, it's going to, you know, part of that whole person is, is them at work, right? So, um, yeah. you know, I think managers and supervisors, you know, whatever your sphere of influence, you know, we can, you know, we can make things better. You know, we can make our, yeah. if, if our organization is relatively hostile, we can at least make an oasis in our, you know, in our department or in our team. Yes. Um, if yes. our organization is on board, we can make sure that we, um, you know, we're the vanguard of that too. So uh, yeah. management supervisors, team leaders are, you know, incredibly important part of this process. And actually yeah. individual employees are too, because it, it can't just be a top-down effort. It needs to eventually become everyone yeah. kind of stepping up for the human beings who work with them. Yeah, actually, that's exactly where I wanted to go. And I think that's why our third path leaders did an amazing job, because they understood with capacity management, actually setting some limits and saying, we can't do it all. is something they had to learn over and over again, as they were trying to balance work and whatever it was that they were trying to do. And, and honestly, they were probably failing sometimes, I certainly have failed a number of times around capacity management. Um, And I think the act of trying to set smart limits, because there's something else you're committed to, helps people get smarter about how they get their work done. Um, and so back to um, individuals, you know, if you're an individual listening in today and, you know, do you have advice for them as a, as a first step that they can take around, you know, how to live more of a whole life wherever they are? Well, I mean, this work is a little more focused on the employers, managers and things, but I, I, have, I have some thoughts. Um, yeah, I think that, you know, pr- uh, c- clear communication with your supervisor is really important. Prioritization is really important. Um, I think if you get an A or an A plus in the most important areas of your job, you get yourself more leeway to you know, be able to, you know, do an OK job in some other things or to have that be delegated somewhere else. Um, if you have a conversation about that. I think that that's really important. I think, um, again, through the pandemic, many employers and managers are much more um, open to these conversations and much more responsive. Uh, One of the lessons of the great resignation of the last few months, I think really is that um, people are gonna vote with their feet um, and look for workplaces that are going to uh, consider them as individuals and, and match 
some of the things that are important to them. It's not just the extra $2 an hour for waiters that like the media has jumped on. I think really it's a, a lot of what's happening are people looking through the last 19 months and looking ahead and you know, yes. seeing, is this a place that's good for me as, as a person? Um, you know, not that I don't have to work hard, not that work is sometimes not work, you know, like some, we all have to do stuff yeah. that, you know, in our work that, you know, is not like life fulfilling or anything, but, you know, in general, are people considering me as a person or, or do I feel, do, do they make me feel like I'm an important part of, of, of the whole here? Um, and people are going to stay at companies that do that. People are going to look for companies that do that. And as you said before, the companies that already had kind of this attitude or culture towards flexibility and, you know, third paths and all this kind of stuff, they were 10 steps ahead when the pandemic hit because yeah. they were able to still communicate and work well at a distance and flexibly. They had lines of trust and collaboration already built. Um, and COVID's not going to be the last thing that disrupts our company. Um, so, you know, right. But if we build resiliency into our organizations by, by having some of these things in place, the, the capacity management, not burning people out, um, you know, uh, more control, over flexibility, in yep. place, right. That's re that's really important. Um, the other thing I'd say as from an individual is, you know, it's, it's, I think it's all well and good to, to say like, um, you know, take care of yourself and time manage and whatever, but, you know, really I, you know, I have a whole chapter about wellness programs in, in this book and wellness. I came into the, the topic of wellness a little cynically because a lot of times I see wellness programs as like a company that's making somebody work 65 hours a week and burning them out. And then <laughs> like a little wellness program so they can show up the next Monday for more, for more abuse. Um, what, what we need to do is have organizations that look at the, what are the root causes of things like burnout and stress and some of the other things and do things for just that. And, you know, we highlight that you for decades have been highlighting this, Jessica. So um, a few of the examples, actually, um, I give in the book, I know um, I, I uh, first learned about these examples through third path events and things like that too. Yeah, thanks. And, and, and please, everybody who's listening in today, understand that that amazing list of people who've done things differently um, that we, we are used as an example of leaders who were able to move ahead with their careers um, following an integrated path. None of them started in a super supportive workplace, um, and many started their own super supportive workplaces. Um, well, thank you, Scott. That's awesome. I want to make sure we uh, get to one of the amazing, there are quite a few amazing examples in your book about people who really have taken this concept of thinking differently about where and when we work and how much we work and it's Delta Emerson. Um, she has done a great job of, uh, you know, not only helping people right now around these issues, but she helped transform Ryan uh, to be uh, from a, you know, kind of a, you know, uh, FaceTime place to a remote workplace that focused on results. And um, it's really been fun to get to know Delta all these years uh, and watch her on her uh, personal journey around these issues as well. Um, one of the things I'm going to use to help us frame what our conversation is with, with Delta is that, you know, you can be fully remote and still work all the time. So if there's no capacity management, just remote work, you aren't necessarily supporting people to live integrated lives. And obviously, we're now much more familiar with, you know, you can have people have um, lots of capacity management, but you're expected to be on site all the time. And that still doesn't really support integrated lives because people have to ask for flexibility and to get accommodation. And that can be challenging and feel like maybe you're going to ding, get a ding in your career path if you ask for any of those changes. So what we're really looking for in a whole person workplace is people who understand flexibility and capacity management and they help people think about how that applies to all the different jobs in the organization. Actually, one of the anecdotes we might not get to is how Delta really did a great job thinking about the specific jobs and helping managers get smart about how much this flex and capacity management apply to all these different jobs. All right, so I'm going to get uh, Delta to talk a little bit about this. And then if we have time, we're going to get to uh, talking about uh, work culture. So Delta, so glad you're here. 
Uh, really, it's just an honor to have both you and Scott here. And, you know, you have so many stories to tell. The one that you've been asked to tell too many times, and you're going to tell it one more time today, <laughs> is how did you change a FaceTime organization to support the concept of remote work? Tell us more about that, Delta. Well, I have to say it takes a village. It wasn't a one person thing. I just happened to be in the seat serendipitously at the time where I had a chance to, to help, help with that effort. Um, Ryan, as you said, was a very intense and is still an intense workplace from a passion standpoint, but there was a huge amount of focus on FaceTime and hours. And it, but what we did related to making the change didn't happen in a knee jerk fashion. It, it's, it was something that had been and there wasn't at one single event like COVID that caused it to happen. Um, we had kind of a trial by fire here with COVID, which has fast forwarded a lot of companies and moving them into this direction. But at Ryan, it had been brewing for a while. Employees really loved and, and loved working at Ryan, but the message was loud and clear that, hey, th this is painful with the hours thing. And, and turnover was beginning, voluntary turnover was beginning to that metric get higher than was um, wanted, much better than our competitors, but still higher than we wanted. And that was really something that had our CEO's attention. And there was a lot of noise around that too, people talking about um, just the workplace in general. So what happened is that there was that tipping point as is often the case. And one of our employees, Christy, um, turned in a re resignation and she was a very uh, on the track to be a superstar. And she basically told Ryan, we were still very small at the time, fairly small. Um, I love this place, but I'm, here's my resignation. I'm leaving. I'm getting married, want to start a family. This place is not conducive to that. And I had been in Brent's ear, so to speak, kind of nagging at him. As I'm sure the word he would use, Brent Ryan, who's the CEO of Ryan, for a long time. And there were little things that I was trying to get him to move a little bit on related to hours and how we handled a number of things. And he wasn't totally receptive at that point. He's a super hard charging man. But that tipping point occurred and he's a very smart man and he's very innovative. And he, he loves diversity of thought and idea in all ways, which works really well for him on all sides. So that tipping point occurred with Christie's conversation. And he basically came into my office after that conversation and said, okay, we're gonna do this. Um, we're gonna create an environment where people can work anywhere, anytime, as long as they get their jobs done. And I almost fainted because I was just looking for a little budge on something. And he also gave us a date. It was six months from me. So we're going to do this in six months. Another smart move on his part because it's not a light, light switch thing. So that's really what happened. And I think within him, getting to know him more as time went on, his epiphanies were, he had two things that beyond that tipping point of that event with Christy was that he said, I realized I, as a CEO and founder, I get to, I am where I need to be, when I need to be to honor the stewardships in my life. Why can't my employees do that? And I thought that was a pretty amazing thing for him to be recognizing and thinking about. And he also realized when he looked back, he, he was 28 when he founded this firm and had come from what, what is now one of the big four. He said he brought with him an innovative approach to handling tax advisory and consulting which they're amazing at, but he brought with him the old approach to managing people. And so he decided it was time to put that innovative spin on that. So that's really what started the whole thing. And we started down that path then and did that 180, which was a tough thing to do because we literally, up to that point, twice a year at performance uh, review time, whatever, in evaluation time, we had two milestones at that point. The first metric that was looked at was how many hours has each person in the organization worked? And it was ranked on an Excel spreadsheet, top to bottom. And we didn't exactly have a trophy for the person who had worked the most hours, which was always Brent, but um, many people were, were nearing him. But that was almost a trophy event. And we went from that to where it doesn't matter where or when you're working as long as you get results. So really, we really had to figure out that part. Um, and figure out how we were going to measure results, which Ryan already did a good job of. So didn't have a lot of work to do there, but created a dashboard and other things so that every individual knew exactly what the expectations were. And there was a way to, to have a conversation about that. There was the role reality piece around those people who 
needed to be in place in certain jobs physically. And so we had to do some creative things around that. But um, we did the four metrics that we're really focused on were what is our turnover, our voluntary turnover? Uh, what is employee engagement with the scores that we were getting there in different ways? What is our client satisfaction? And what, is our, what are our financial results? And you notice that that doesn't reverse order of what many companies would because there was a full realization that in order to get the financial results and have happy clients, you've gotta have a good and happy workforce. And again, I think the, the big benefit that Ryan had was having Brent at the helm and, and being receptive to that. He had to do a lot of changing of perspective to get to, to the point that he very comfortably and enthusiastically endorsed what we were about to do. And that's one of the things that I think is really important. You can't go into this very grudgingly at all. It can't just be a check the box. It can't just be a, a right reaction that you just give it a shot without a lot of planning because the planning behind the scenes was enormous and it took a village there. We didn't just go as HR behind closed doors and do that. There was a diverse team and we figured out what, would, what we thought would work. We knew then that we would make mistakes, but then when we made them, it wasn't because we didn't let everybody get involved. We just got together and figured out what to do around that. So we did have some problems um, along the way. And the one thing, Scott, that you mentioned is the, and Jessica, you talked about the importance of the manager. We realized that we didn't really set our managers up for success as well as we could have up front. It wasn't totally a light switch, but we had all the policies and here's the how, but we didn't do a lot of work there. And so we did do work as we got into it and realized we need to work with these folks and help them. Because as you can imagine, with the diversity of preferences around work style, there was not a lot of enthusiasm with some of our senior leaders. That's one thing Brent <laughs> had to had to recognize and deal with. Many he had about 19 partners at the time. He has quite a few more now, but many of them were thinking, Brent, this place is going to close down the day that we flip the switch and people can work anywhere, anytime. Um, but you really have to. We had to worry about that that type of thing. But we didn't set the managers up for success, so we did do developed some training that resulted in blueprints, um, the concept of a blueprint where teams were encouraged and given the, the tools to make it happen, to come together as a team and figure out how are we gonna work together as a pod of 10 or 12 people, whatever the size was. And that, that, that blueprint was uh, turned into HR just for record, not for comment or judgment. And it was really interesting to see how they all came up with very creative approaches. For example, we're gonna socialize twice a week in this way. Um, we are all gonna have office hours physically on these two days a week, these hours when we can, unless there's a client on-site visit or something like that. But that was one thing that I, I think helped quite a bit as well. Um, we realized that there are, there were, we knew what was gonna happen when we, when we did this and flip the switch. And we did this in 2008. So Ryan was obviously ready to hit the ground running when, when COVID hit. <laughs> They'd been at this for a while. It was like a problem, but not, it was, almost, it was almost like disaster recovery in advance related to this. And I actually, I would say, having managed disaster recovery in another company a couple of times, I, one thing I realized quickly is working with our IT people is this is something we need to document within our business resumption plan because we've got we've got the framework for what, what we'll do if our people are stuck at home, we're stuck in a weird place. We had the technology in place, we had everything else in place. But we did know that we were going to lose some people. There were gonna be some people who didn't rise to the occasion. And it happened, those people was like, yay. Uh, we hired at that time a lot of people straight out of college, still Ryan still does, but they've also got a lot of growth coming in with season hires. Um, but there were some people who hadn't yet developed a work ethic that allowed them to recognize when I'm working from home, that doesn't mean I'm just going to wait for someone to ping me. That means I really do need to work. Not a lot of people, but there's some people that just needed a little bit more guidance and discipline. Um, that was definitely one thing that was going to happen. And we knew that some managers, which was more of a concern, no matter what we did, would have a hard time embracing it. And so a company has to recognize those two things are going to happen. You can do the very best you can to get something like this set up, but you're going to have some things you'll have to deal with on the, on the back side and, and sometimes make some tough decisions around that. But again, just back to the whole story, um, I give a huge amount of credit to Brent for the, the willingness as a leader 
to open his mind. And that's why his business is successful. He doesn't just, he's very positional on site then I've said it to him, but he'll move that position. He loves diversity of thought and opinion around him. And if a leader is so stuck in a mindset that my way or the highway, this is the way I prefer it, everybody should do this. It's going to be a tough world to live in from a business perspective ongoing. Um, so that's basically the Ryan story in a nutshell, but it was a, it's oh. been, it was an interesting journey to be part of that. And it's so cool to see what's happening with Ryan ongoing. It's, it's still um, a talent attractor. Uh, it's a magnet listed on the great place to work list, multiple countries around the world, multiple times, and many other types of awards and recognition, the core of which um, ties to culture and how employees feel. So it's, uh, it's worth doing. It's necessary. It's a business imperative today. It, it really yeah. was back then, but Brent was more of an early adopter. And, but today businesses and leaders have to step back and be very introspective about what is my personal mindset? What are we doing? What is the business yeah. about? Now, businesses are yeah. in business to stay in business. So I, I strongly believe there are two sides to that equation. As you and Scott talked about a moment ago, it's here's the organization, but I, as an individual have to figure out what are my preferences and what is gonna work for me, but I have to be realistic. If I accept a stewardship of a company, I have to honor that stewardship. I can't just say, well, you need to adjust everything just for me. And a company yeah. recognizes we're getting all kinds of people through the door. We need that diversity. We can accommodate most of that diversity in one way or the other, but you have to make sure businesses are in business to stay in business. So if I accept a job, for example, where role reality says I need to be physically in place, and maybe I'm the receptionist in a building that has brick and mortar and they have people coming in and out. But I see other people coming in at weird times or not see them. And I start getting resentful about that and make an issue. I need to really be realistic about the role I accepted and then yeah, honor that. Yeah. You've, um, yeah, you've said so many important things, Delta. And that one is a great one to, to just tag on to right for a second because, you know, again, that goes right back to different jobs, different solutions. And you really, I love the phrase role reality. And having people at all levels of the organization understand that there's going to be a uh, role reality for different jobs. Um, and maybe that receptionist could be a different person on different days or whatever. They can find some flexibility, but just not, not that kind of flexibility. And that's exactly what we did, Jessica. We did um, ask the, re, the, the group that, that handled phones and handled face, face fronting in the, in the office to get together and figure out what that could look like. Some people decided that they liked hours that were more on, because we had long hours that the, the phones needed to be open because of international. So there, were, there was flexibility, but it was different. It wasn't the same as, as being able to sit down, just get up and, and your jammies if you wanted to and work. Not that everybody does that, yeah. but some do. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. But it, was, it is possible. So flexibility takes on a different slant, a different meaning. Yeah. And I think it's important to let employees have a part in designing what that can look like. That, that was critical to Ryan, having that team that included all, not just HR, but every department was represented, marketing, IT, finance, every single group, representatives that they chose to participate in some of the leaders. But, and they were constantly going back to their teams with designing what our whole new world was gonna look like was everybody yeah. had a handprint on it. Yeah, I mean, yeah no, I think that when, when I think about, um, what I wanted to underscore from your point, Delta, and then I want to make sure we get to our, our next couple of things, although Scott, you might have something you want to say. I wanted to really underscore that team concept because I think that's a really fabulous place to go in and make change because you can understand, you have influence in that team and you can kind of think about what, how the, the role reality of all the different team members and you can, the uniqueness of each team member, and you can come up with a solution and then you can revise that solution as things keep on changing. So I love that point. I also love the point that you made that you know um, you're gonna you might lose some people, and and that where it began was with senior leadership really opening up their minds to think differently, and that's where I get a little worried about where will the future take us, is I think some senior leaders have been holding their breath, getting through the pandemic, hoping to return to the normal, and uh, and I'm a little worried that they're not. Have, some senior leaders haven't opened their minds to what's possible. We have a couple of really big questions we want to talk about between the three of us, but there might be something uh, one of you wants to say really urgently 
before we talk about our big questions. Yeah, if Scott? I could just jump in about, you know, some jobs can't flex in the same way that other jobs can, but we can value each of these people, right? Uh, and by listening to them, by uh, letting them have a say in how things operate, right? That's a way to value our employees, right? And, and to really show our respect for them. But also if it's not flex, maybe they can't do that. But, but what are we doing in terms of um, our benefits and supports and our pay structure and our physical safety in a workplace like warehouse employees, and retail employees and things like that. These are ways that we can show our support and respect uh, for, for anyone yeah. at any type of company. Um, so I think that's an important point that sometimes we think about this as like a white collar flexibility thing. Um, but if we're creative about it, we can really, uh, you know, find uh, ways to work with everyone in a way that that shows how much we, we value them. And again, not yeah. just as part of the machine, but as a person. Yes, yes. And, and, and really when you support people to live whole lives, Maybe that's a big takeaway too. They're very willing to be creative in thinking about this, looking for what we call a triple win, where it's good for the business, good for getting that work done, and good for the people that they work with. Um, so yeah, I think there's a, lots of good solutions out there. I wanted to make sure we got to some of the, the challenges many of us are facing as we look ahead, even in our whole person workplaces, uh, we might be facing some of these challenges. You know, one is, I have been a support of uh, hybrid and remote workplaces forever. Uh, but I do know that one of the challenges can be, does it make it more confusing where this workday starts and where the workday ends? And what have you been learning, one of you or both of you around, um, how do we help people around this concept where the workday begins and ends in a more hybrid or remote workplace? Who would like to take that first? I, 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 one thing I would share there that has been interesting to me, um, Scott, I'm sure you're having experiences there as well, but I coach as well. I coach individuals um, and executives related to business and kind of that career navigation path. And one thing that I found interesting, there are two young leaders that I'm coaching. One is in, uh, they're in two, two different countries and they have, they really have huge challenges with the fact that um, remote work takes over their lives. They're hard chargers and they work like crazy anyway. And they've been, one of them has been working remotely. Her company has worked remotely for over 10 years. And I'm now working with them. They want to get back in. They've never been in brick and mortar and that they want to get into brick and mortar. If that doesn't shock you, but that's, that's a paradigm shift. But what they, they both have, they struggle mightily with the fact that they have, the work is never done, whose work is ever done, unless you've got a really specific widget responsibility or something where the you know, bell rings and you leave. And so they tend to work all the time. And that's one of the things that I'm spending more time, I have others that are not in other, I mean, it's not just because these are in other, people are in other countries, but I think it's become one of the biggest topics of discussion around this because many people um, are so integrated in their work and their lives that they're always thinking about it. And if their work is, if their desk with all their stuff on it is just right there all the time, even if it's a floor away, it's so easy to get up and go down on the Saturday morning and hit that and realize you worked all day when you might not have, and have kids that are wondering where mom and dad are. I think it's become that boundary setting is probably the next big conversation that we're gonna have to work with because people are gonna suffer mentally and physically because of that, I think. And their families will too, if they don't rein that in. Some people are better than others. I'm a self-confessed workaholic and that's the biggest challenge for me. If it's too close to me physically, then that makes it even easier to get sucked into it. And there are other people who are better at moving away from that. Um, Ellen Kosick's book, CEO of Me, if you ever uh, glanced at that puts forth that there are people and it's kind of are there people who there are people who live to work and others who work to live and somebody who lives to work has a better chance of figuring this one out than the flip of that I, Scott what's your yeah. thinking on that yeah I, well some of the things I've seen that that have worked fairly well um, um, individuals you know who, who want to 
you know, push back against this tide, right? So sometimes it's encouraged by the employer and sometimes we do it for ourselves, right? So mm -hmm. uh, it's a battle with two fronts. Um, but one thing that people could do, I think, is if you could really clarify with your supervisor or your work team, you know, what are the, the deliverables? What are the metrics? What are the goals, right? Mm -hmm. And then someone who is a hard charger, maybe they find that, okay, I, I hit my goals for today or for this week or whatever. And now I can unplug. Um, and instead of just a constant to-do list, right, it's a to -do <laughs> it could be broken into smaller like to-do lists. And that takes discipline and that's not easy. I'm, I'm saying it kind of glibly, but uh, that, that's one part of it. Um, you know, I think also, you know, flexibility is great. I'm an integrator, right? So like, um, you know, I'll respond to emails at all different times and things like that. But I'm also pretty good at like, because I will dive into work at odd times, that means during like prime hours, I can sometimes be away um, and, you know, pick up my son or, or you know, do all these other things. So, um, you know, if it's, I'm doing all my work during regular time, plus I'm doing this extra work afterward, that's a di different mindset than saying, yeah, I might work at any given point during this 12 hour stretch, but I'm not going to work, you know, I'm going to make sure that there's, there's, there's pieces there. But that's from an individual point of view. I think managers and supervisors need to role model this. Um, and even if they're, it's good for them as workaholics or whatever to be working late at night, don't send that email or set it to deliver at nine in the next morning. Um, you know, and things like that uh, are important. And then from a work place and employer point of view. Um, it's a little radical in the US, but in Europe, you know, places are doing this where they shut their servers down um, at night uh, to discourage overwork and, and things like that. So uh, there's different yeah. levels to it, but sometimes we do it to ourselves, absolutely. And, you know, part of the cost of having a good upperly mobile career is that there's going to be occasional overwork. And I think that's okay. Yep. If some weeks yep. are like big weeks, but every week can't be a big week or else you burn out. Like chronic overwork yeah. is the key um yeah. so i yeah. think sometimes that's the other thing about like you can't beat yourself up if some one a couple weeks get get away from you um you got to think about longer term balance uh, as well yeah which and, means vacation and, I think, and and other things need to be used fully yes Good. yeah i, was, I, I want to put just, one thing on the table hold, hold on i want to put one thing on the table because i think back to your team concept this is something we do at third path we're very transparent about what our expectations are around when we're working and when we're not working as a team, as an organization. And I think that really helps both because we, you know, it's flex the two way street, right? So sometimes I do ask someone to work when they're not tra traditionally working, but sometimes they need to not work when they're traditionally working. And so getting really transparent about when are we working or when are we not working means if I send an email late at night, there's no expectation that people have to respond to me because we know collectively we're not working. And so again, there's 10 other ways to do it, but I think the team answer where teams can set some norms around this um, might help you listeners today. Um, now we're not, you know, we're not, as uh, Delta said, we're not like trial by fire into remote work. We can start refining our approach um, and start thinking what works well for our team around expectations around the beginning and end of the work day. Delta, you wanted to add something too. I was just back to the point about the working, the email and all that. I think that what I think about a lot is the need for authenticity and grace to be there with all of us when we're working with each other because of personal preferences. And this mm -hmm. week I received a, a kickback note from someone. I work with a consulting company. We go back and forth on a lot of stuff. And it said her at the bottom of her signature, it's something along the lines of, I recognize that we all have different approaches to when and where we work, and I honor that, and so don't worry, you know, I mean, she was basically, it was worded very nicely to say, hey, because I think that that message is saying, if you're up at two in the morning because you had a great idea and you had to get it off your chest and out there, it's okay, I'm not going to judge you for that. I do worry, when, because I tend to be the person who sometimes will it like last night was one for me a really light when it had to be for a deadline but and the person I was sending the email was involved in it so new but sometimes I feel guilt and I'll go do I need to save that one delay it but that then it takes some of my time so it's really I'm working with a group of people where that doesn't really matter um because yeah. of the, the the ground rules we've set with each other around that so yeah yeah 
Well, and I, I was going to add too. you know, this is clearly we could have just spent the whole time just talking about this. But, you know, uh, work, we are also very transparent at Third Path that, you know, you need to have quiet, focused work time, too. Um, and so, you know, a lot of people are in meetings and dealing with email all day long, and then they go home and get their quiet, focused work time done. And so I think, again, some intentionality about um, I've been, it's been really fun to see some of the organizations in the third type community say, hey, we're going to have these days in the office, these days are home days where people are actually doing quiet focused work time. And I was like, yay. So, you know, again, I think there's a way for us to start thinking smarter about how do we make the most of all these opportunities and not have them uh, drain, become draining um, as, instead. So I've seen I want to get to a couple... Go ahead. Calendars, um, that they block up time for like, this is my quiet time, head down work. You know, please don't schedule anything yep. here. You know, just as an example. Yeah. We encourage every person at Third Path to really specifically think about that. Exactly, Scott. I think it's, uh, it, you know, again, depending on the kind of work you do. Um, although it's been interesting. I had a conversation with uh, somebody who's come up with this really cool thing for their administrative people because their administrative people needed quiet, focused work time too. And so they've come up with this kind of, you know, different people taking different shifts and getting some quiet focused work time as part of their normal work week. So I think everybody can benefit from, from thinking about these things. Um, there might be some one more thing burning out there that either one of you want to say before we get on to our next little bit. Yeah, one last thing. So one thing an organization can do, because sometimes the, it's the pressure of individual feels that I'm the one responsible for something. So if I'm off, like it's going to fall apart. Um, so if we build substitutability in the, in, into work, you know, making sure things are responsibilities of teams and even having teams overlap so that if somebody's on parental leave, it's not like we're, you know, missing, you know, we, we have, um, you know, shared, uh, people already are up to date on projects, they can jump in, they can support each other so people can't step away on vacation or other types of leave. Yeah, these are all good examples of thinking smart about capacity management um, so that people can really have the right amount of work. Um, and then, you know, be able to uh, take a vacation, you know, do all the other things that we want to do. So we're getting close to um, the end of our webinar. And I hope as you've been listening in that you've got some good questions for us, because we've got, as you see, some very smart people to ask your questions to. Um, and, you know, as we're getting you to get some questions out there, uh, we're going to just touch on the subject of workplace culture. And I just, I liked uh, Scott's definition. It's a set of shared assumptions and values and norms that identifies what an organization considers important and how employees and managers should behave. Um, and I think there's one other thing he said in this book that I thought was really helpful. He talked about how, you know, because of his uh, background around helping around fatherhood issues and parental leave, um, that it took three to five years of consistent decision-making, messaging, communication, role modeling, and follow through to change the stories around fatherhood and parental leave. So as we're trying to imagine becoming hybrid workplaces, Scott, I think it's fair to say that we should be thinking, it'll take three to five years of experimentation, decision-making, managing, communication, role modeling, and follow through to really get us to, to think differently about that. So I'm going to, that was my last slide before um, we open up for question and answers. Um, Scott, would you agree that it's going to take a little while for people to uh, make this change for the long run? Yeah, it depends where you are, right? And you can always have small wins along the way, but to fundamentally change the value structure of an organization takes a, a lot of time and consistent decision making around it. So, you know, really what, you know, if I could sum up the whole person workplace in, in a concept, it's this you know, embracing a set of values that we value employees as whole people. And then how do we enact those values over time in whatever ways we can? And for large organizations, you could do like big, you know, big, you know, interventions. In smaller organizations, maybe it's just making sure nobody to start before 10 a.m. So people don't have the stress of dropping off daycare and being late um, and everything in between. So, um, and if we're consistent in our decision-making and our policy-making, um, you know, the, the culture really becomes real. And, um, and again, in smaller units, individual managers and supervisors can make that change happen much more quickly. Smaller businesses can make that change happen more quickly. Um, but, you know, uh, like Delta said it, at Ryan, you know, they didn't, it wasn't a light switch. It involves a whole lot of people in the planning and the implementation. And that's how 
the, the change like becomes really part of the fabric of the organization instead of just like some add-on that could go away at, at some other point in time. Yeah. I think and, I, and I, gotta, add, I think it's super important once you've got made that move and you've got the workplace set up, you've got your culture identified, what your aspiration is, that you have to just you have to constantly maintain and check because it's like having values hanging on a wall. How many companies businesses have that? Do you live to that? Is what what is the end in mind you're trying to accomplish here? And and would your people say yes? That's that's who we are. And so having listening systems in place, including entry yeah. interviews, stay interviews, exit interviews, but ongoing pulse interviews and data coming in and anecdotal things and listening to all of that to figure out have we gotten off base here? Is there something wrong? Because you can, it's not one and done. It has to be tweaked constantly and you have to look in the mirror and see if people really believe what you're what you're touting. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. So I'm hoping, um, you know, this is new for us to be on camera. And so I think we we'll just hear Sergio's voice, but uh, we're hoping that Sergio has some questions from the audience uh, to ask Scott or Delta about what we've been talking about today. Um, and certainly there's more we could be talking about around the culture change piece too. But we wanted to first check whether there's some questions out there, Sergio. Well, I guess we'll just hear your voice if you have a question that you want to share with us from the audience. Here Hello, everyone. We do have one question. And the Great. question is, what are some of the things the younger generation should have in mind when it comes to fostering a healthy work culture? Oh, thank you, younger generation, for asking that question. Either well, you want to add something? Yeah, if I could just jump in, because I, I teach at a college, so uh, I feel like I, <laughs> I, I live this to some degree. And I'm super encouraged by, you know, the young professionals I've helped launch into the workplace over the last decade or so are much more upfront about wanting to work um, at a place that mirrors their values, and their priorities, at least in some degree. And I think it's incumbent on employers to, to make that case that here you can build not just your money or a career, but here's how the career interacts with your life and your priorities. So um, I think that, you know, then young people, I think when they're hired into these organizations um, can really, um, thankfully they're, they're much more like pushy about what they want, which I think is a good thing. <laughs> um, and they get involved. And so, so, I mean, I think if, if you just joined an organization and you don't know where to start, you don't want to ruffle feathers, you know, maybe there's some task forces or, you know, listening programs and things you can get involved in. Uh, maybe there's an employee resource group you can get involved in in the short run. Um, and these are ways you can build up some of your credibility so that then you become a, a role model and a peer leader um, going forward. And then when you get promoted up and you have more sphere of influence, you know, you can start bringing those values uh, much more in. But that, that's maybe where I would start if I'm a young, newer employee. Um, to learn the whole organization and get involved in a few, uh, a few ways that are important. Wonderful, wonderful. And again, I'm watching the clock. Delta might have one quick comment, and then I want to make sure if Sergio has another question that we get to that. Delta, quick comment? Quick comment. I just coincidentally had a call from my daughter, who um, is 34, and she's a founding partner in a law firm here in Denver. And she's a super successful little firm, amazing business thing. But she called this morning to say, mom, what has happened to the younger generation? Because, and I just cracked up. I said, what are you talking about? Aren't you part of that? And she said, no, she, but she was talking with some peers who are also very young and have law firms. And they're seeing a big difference in the way that people fresh out of college are coming into work and what their expectations are. And um, so I don't have the answer to that, but it was interesting to hear someone who's quite a bit younger than I am say, there's this younger <laughs> generation, what are they doing? What's gonna happen to our workplace? Um, but it's, it's interesting. And she was attributing part of it to social media and the um, influence that it has had on kids that have had it since they were 10 years old. She was in college when Facebook hit and it was just utilitarian then. So I think we've got a lot to figure out around that. But at the end of the day, when you're accepting a job, regardless of what generation you come from, whether you're 22 or, or 50, you've got to really make sure that what they're asking you to do aligns with your lifestyle so that you can actually do that job and will without getting in and, and being surprised that there are certain protocols and things that are in place. So it's a two, 
I have, I've got a blog I wrote um, a couple few years ago that was on Forbes and it's, would you hire you? And I did that when I was asked to write one about work-life flexibility. And I said, I'm gonna take the other, I'm gonna take a little different angle on this. And because you have to, business are in business to stay in business, no matter who you are, you've got to help make that happen. And you can't just use your generation as an excuse to, to not get with the program. If that program is one you don't like, then don't join it. So there's a lot to figure out there that you have to get very introspective about that as an employer and as an employee. Great, wonderful. Hey, so we're almost out of time, Sergio. We might only have time for one more question if there's a question out there. Otherwise, I'll put up our final slides. So we have a couple of questions and I'm going to invite everybody to uh, join the discussion in our Facebook group. We're gonna post them and maybe we can have Scott and Delta um, add on to those questions because we have a very active chat here today. Uh, I'm gonna pick oh. one question um, that is uh, a bit different so we can bring it to the conversation. And the question is, how does this intersect with diversity and inclusion? On one hand, more flexibility supports a more di diverse workforce by nature, but I've seen data that some groups, example, veterans, struggle with managing teams on a flexible environment. Wow. So you are so spot on, and we actually are going to have a whole webinar on this topic because this is the truth. I believe... Um, we can really create a much more supportive and diverse workplace because we've gotten smart around these issues. But as Delta pointed out, in her journey at Ryan, there were some supervisors that needed some extra help. There were some leaders that needed some extra help, some that actually weren't gonna be able to change. So although we're running out of time today, your question is so spot on. Please tune back um, to our webinar later this year where we're specifically looking at this issue it's so critical, so important to lasting change. So wonderful. I'm, I'm really glad there's an active chat. And it reminded me that I wanted to mention a couple things before we wrap up. And I am going to give Delta and uh, Scott one chance to say something that they would um, advise people today listening in, one, one word of advice. But, you know, as you can see, um, if you'd like we have one of our speakers um, uh, in December has made a book available for us. We're gonna be talking all about wellness at our town hall in December. It's gonna be an interactive discussion where people break up and talk about things. And if you would like a copy of Kira's book, just put your name and address into the text box and one person will win a book today. Um, so just a heads up about what's around the corner about a town hall on wellness. Um, and I, you know, as I mentioned, November, we're gonna have this uh, great uh, breakout group uh, webinar on managers to talk more about that. And that's very connected to creating diverse workplaces, I'll promise you. Um, and as uh, Sergio mentioned, we're launching our Facebook group. So we're very purposely gonna continue the conversation, um, you know, all the way through from one webinar to the next. So join us in our Facebook group, uh, bring your questions there. Uh, we will look forward to talking about them on in our Facebook group. So Scott, one piece of advice to our listeners today, something that you learned, and then I'll ask Delta, and, and we'll, um, we only have a couple minutes, so keeping it short too. Yeah, I, I think that it's important that we lead, I think, with um, some sort of empathy around what people are dealing with. It has been an incredibly difficult two years for so many, even those who have been relatively lucky, you know, um, have dealt with extra stress, extra juggling, you know, doing things differently. Um, you know, so I think we need to just be a little more understanding of people and maybe what they might be dealing with in, in their personal lives and things like that. So it's important that if you want to make some of these whole person workplace like changes, um, you know, be empathetic, listen, ask questions and listen, or truly listen. And then finally start where you are. If you have a culture that's already pretty well developed, see what you could do to advance it. If you're starting your journey to get there, you know, see what you could do um, in terms of building momentum around it. And um, finally, I just want to put a, a plug in here. Um, if, uh, you know, again, uh, if some of the things we talked about today are things that interest you, um, I would love it if you pick up a copy of the book. I put a link in the chat. And I'd be happy if you wanted to reach out to me on LinkedIn or through this Facebook group or anything else to, to talk about these issues. 
um, or, or anything like that going forward. Yes, uh, I want to put a plug in for Scott's book too. It's really a great, great book uh, full of really good information. Thank you, Scott. Delta, some wisdom from all the years of your help around these issues. Well, the, the one thing when you ask us to narrow down that I have to land on is it's, and Scott, and you've already touched on this, is success measures. You need to make sure uh, if you're the employer who is planning this type of environment, you've got to have, be able to have an intelligent conversation with each other about why something is or is not working. So you've got to do the work to figure out for each position, each task, whatever is expected so that you can have those intelligent conversations and that when something happens, you can be both courageous and considerate. But if you don't figure out how are we gonna measure whether or not this is working at an individual level based on the role that person has, it will go south quickly. So measures, and, and Ryan did a really good job of that at the macro level and at the individual level. So that's the one thing, if I could give no other advice, I'd say, just know that's the big nugget to me. Wow. Well, I can't thank you both enough. Um, and those who are listening in, you know, thank you so much for being here today for the launch of this season's webinars. Um, please follow us on social media and make sure to check out our new Facebook group uh, so we can continue the conversation um, and keep on doing it and making that third path happen. Thank you, everybody, for being here today. Bye, everyone.